I'm just delighted to uh, be able to moderate the last panel. We've got three great um, speakers. The focus of the panel is scientific integrity and replication. So it actually flows really well from Smriti's talk because we're going to get into issues of re uh, replication, replicability, um, and also scientific integrity, which has been an issue and a theme that's central to BITS and central to the whole open science movement, uh, of course. Um, we're going to hear about some new developments in this space. Uh, we're going to hear, uh, you know, more from Don. I'm going to give introductions in a second uh, about uh, a pretty high-profile case that people may have heard of um, in uh, psychology uh, involving the the Data Colada team and um, Professor Francesca Gino and the the issue there of fraud that I think got a lot of media attention. So uh, I think. Should be a pretty, pretty interesting set of topics that really flow well. So let me give just some introductions, and then each of the panelists will get a chance to make some opening remarks, and then we can kind of open up a conversation and some questions. So um, uh, Devi, is, Devi Prasad is a first-year PhD student at Emory uh, with a focus on impact evaluation and water sanitation and hygiene. Uh, she previously worked at 3IE, where she led replication studies and supported the Research Transparency Initiative. Um, and uh, she has an MPH from uh, Boston University and a BA in molecular and cell biology from here at UC Berkeley. So uh, just so delighted to have her back uh, here on campus. Um, Don Moore holds the Lorraine Tyson Mitchell Chair in um, Leadership and is a professor at the Haas School of Business here at the University of California, Berkeley. His research interests include overconfidence, including when people think they're better than they actually are, when people think they're better than others, and then and when they're too sure they know the truth. That seems relevant to a lot of situations. Um, he's only occasionally overconfident. I'm just reading what I'm given here. I don't know if that's true. Uh, and then last, Patrick Vu is a PhD candidate in economics at Brown University, uh, where he was awarded the George Sports Prize for Best Dissertation in the Fall. Oh, in the fall, he'll begin as an assistant professor at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, uh, Australia. His research interests are in econometrics with a focus on publica how publication bias impacts the statistical credibility of published research uh, and the quality of evidence-based policy decisions. So we're going to start actually with Don, who's going to introduce the problem of scientific um, integrity in the social sciences then go to um, Patrick, and then to uh, Debbie. So that, that's gonna be kind of the ordering. And I guess we'll start with Don. I guess you have a, a few slides, right, Don? So. Thanks, Ted. Uh, I, I should begin by just um, uh, uh, signing a note of appreciation to Ted, to Grace, to all the folks at BITS. Um, it is a, uh, this is, day has been uh, an inspiration and, and it's an honor to, to um, be able to um, uh, uh, talk to you. When trying to replicate a recipe, um, that uh, for us to be able to do our jobs as scientists, for our science to be cumulative, we have to be able to replicate published results in order to build on them and in order to correct the scientific record when false positives make it into the literature. So how does that happen? Uh, the quality of the evidence in the scientific literature is fundamentally uh, degraded by p-hacking when researchers exploit undisclosed researcher degrees of freedom in order to inflate uh, the significance of their reported results, often to get the p-value down below the uh, statistical significance threshold of 0 0.05. More pernicious than p-hacking, though, is, of course, fraud, when researchers make up their data or manipulate data that they've collected in a way to, that, to make it look um, more impressive than it actually is. And um, Ted made reference to a particularly high profile case at the moment, uh, one that I am painfully and intimately connected to. Francesca Gino was my postdoc at Carnegie Mellon. Um, 
And the evidence of fraud in her published work was identified by my friend and office neighbor and uh, colleague at Haas, Leif Nelson. Um, when uh, so, so the uh, the data collada folks um, took up the the Gino case when a whistleblower came to them and asked them. There was a, a long back and forth between them during which uh, the whistleblower brought evidence. The data collada folks pushed back. Um, they. Uh, worked really hard to get raw data files, um, went through them in some painstaking ways that they document on the Data Collada website. Um, they shared uh, some of those uh, disturbing insights with Harvard University that conducted its own investigation, and Data Collada uh, posted the results of their work on their blog last summer following uh, the completion of Harvard's investigation and their decision to put Francesca Gino on unpaid leave. Uh, Gino then uh, turned around and sued Harvard and Data Collada uh, for wrongful termination and defamation, uh, asking for $25 million in restitution. Some of you may have seen the GoFundMe campaign that some of us organized to help Leif and Joe and Yuri pay their legal bills to defend themselves against the charge. Um, it is, of course, an existential threat to the academic freedom that all of us depend on in order to be able to engage in respectful dialogue with one another about scientific facts without fear that we're going to be sued or that the scientific conversation is going to be complicated by involving attorneys in the legal system. So um, I'll just uh, note the, whoops, uh, I'd intended to advance there. Um, uh, my own experience with this case has reinforced for me some of the um, guidance that uh, prior cases have led us toward. Um, Yuri Simonson, after documenting his work um, revealing the fraud committed by Dirk Smeesters and um, Larry Sanna some years ago, wrote a short paper entitled Just Post It in which he argued data posting is absolutely essential for being able to identify cases of fraud after the fact. He acknowledged the difficulty in uh, getting fraud to zero in the published literature and all the reasons why scientists may be tempted to engage in fraud if it allows us to report impressive and surprising results uh, as exist in too many of Francesca's papers. Um, if we, uh, if some of those results do make it into the published literature, at the very least, we'd like to be able to identify it after the fact and posted data increases our probability of doing that. Looking back on my collaborations, I wish I had insisted on having more details on having all the raw data on having it posted. Um, and as a field, I think we should insist on that now, now. Um, in my collaborations, I insist on getting the raw data. In uh, my reviews for journals, I insist on getting the data before I will undertake a review. Um, in my evaluation of colleagues at the Haas School, I more favorably evaluate cases if I can have access to the data and code that the authors uh, based their their research on. Um, all of us have a role to play in holding each other to higher standards and reducing the probability that people can get away with introducing fraudulent results into the scientific literature. I'll stop there. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to speak very briefly about uh, some of my work on replications, trying to answer this very simple but important question, which is why are replication rates so low? All right, so to give uh, some very brief background, uh, of course, this audience uh, doesn't need a lot of background for this. The replication uh, crisis uh, is a very important issue, and a big part of the mounting interest uh, in it has been these large-scale replication projects, which have shown across different fields that uh, findings from uh, top journals, when they're replicated, tend to have low replication rates, uh, somewhere between 35 to 65%.
And so the definition used here of replication is the binary measure. Uh, and this is one of the most prominent uh, definitions. Uh, and what it means is that the replication estimate to be deemed uh, replicated has to satisfy two criteria. Firstly, that it's statistically significant. And secondly, that it has the same sign as the original estimate. Uh, and so these have been low in large scale replication studies, but also other measures like relative effect sizes have been relatively weak. Relatively weak. So the obvious question here is what is the source of low replication rates? And there's been a lot of work here. So people have talked about selective publication and in particular, uh, the favoring of statistically significant results in the publication process. Uh, a separate but related issue is p-hacking, that is conscious and unconscious uh, behavior efforts to try push results towards uh, those that are more publishable. Uh, and also something that's been talk spoken about a lot is heterogeneous treatment effects. Uh, when I run a replication, am I in fact uh, testing uh, the exact same question? Maybe conditions are different, maybe samples are different. Uh, perhaps this accounts also for low replicability. And so what I'm doing in my paper is to actually ask about uh, something a bit different, which I think has received less attention, which is how might replication design itself contribute to low replication rates? And I'm going to focus in particular on two features. So the first is selection on significance. And in particular, uh, in most replication studies, only statistically significant results are selected for replication. So what's the problem with this? Well, if you're selecting samples based on any extreme characteristic, whether it be height, test scores, or statistical significance, it uh, mechanically, what you're going to have is that you're going to get regression to mean to the mean in repeated samples. Okay, and this goes back to uh, all the way to Galton in the 19th century. So uh, it shouldn't be surprising uh, that replication uh, effect sizes are actually smaller than original effect sizes based on the way replication studies are typically, not always, but typically designed. A second more subtle issue, but the one that turns out, turns out to be very important, is how replication sample sizes are set. And so this is done very differently across different replication studies, but a very common approach is to try to detect the original effect size with some pre-specified power level, say 90% or 80%. And one issue with this method, which is uh, not obvious, but it is important, is that the power function is actually nonlinear in effect sizes. And when you don't account for this, it turns out that replication rates are going to be lower than you expect. And so what I do in this paper, uh, firstly, theoretically, is to show that these two issues combined imply, actually, that the expected replication rate is always going to fall below its nominal target. Uh, and so say if the uh, nominal target is to uh, detect original effect sizes with 90% power, in expectation, replication rates uh, must fall below this nominal target, irrespective of whether there's publication bias or treatment effect heterogeneity. So in some sense, this means that observed replication rates are a bit hard to judge against uh, the target that's actually given for them. All right, so that's the more theoretical part of the paper. And the second part of the paper uh, asks, I think, uh, a very important question, which is, which is does this even matter empirically? Uh, what happens in practice? So I take a look at three large-scale replication studies uh, in economics, in psychology, and in social science. And I use an empirical model uh, from another paper, which is looking at publication bias. And what I do is I generate, I show that you can generate out of sample replication predictions, only accounting for these replication design issues. Uh, it's out of sample in the sense that this estimation of this model is only using original uh, data. It doesn't use the replication data, which it's trying to predict. And so to be a bit more uh, precise, the null hypothesis that I'm testing is whether the replication rates we observe in practice can be explained by these two issues that I've highlighted. Uh, and in particular, the model uh, does not include p-hacking, doesn't include treatment effect tetracinate. And so here are the results. So let's take a look first at uh, experimental economics. So the nominal power given was 92%. The observed replication rate was 61%. The predicted replication rate, remarkably, is very close at 60%. Uh, 
we see something uh, fairly similar in social sciences, which is that the observed rate is 57% and the predicted replication rate with the model is 54%. And so in these two cases, we can't reject the null hypothesis that uh, in economics and social sciences, that these two issues can actually account by themselves for observed replication rates. Of course, you can see the standard errors are fairly large, so it doesn't mean these other things are not necessarily happening. Uh, but the point estimates are actually pretty uh, close, which is surprising, I think. Uh, lastly, if we look at psychology, the uh, target is, again, 92%. The observed replication rate uh, is 35%, whereas the predicted replication rate is around 54 So. Uh, in this case, the model does less well, which suggests that something else is going on, that the model's uh, not necessarily uh, fitting the data as well. And so just for a final comment, I, I want to say like something about how we should interpret this result. So the first thing is that these two issues with replication design, at least in these specific studies, uh, look like they're empirically uh, important. Uh, and the second thing is to think about what it's actually saying about original studies. So. Uh, it turns out that both of these issues interact very importantly with the power of original studies. And in particular, they're much worse when the power of original studies is very low. And so part of what you're seeing here uh, in the low replication rates is the fact that original studies are relatively underpowered. And so uh, that does say something about the uh, credibility of the original studies being replicated. And, and with that, I'll end and pass it to Debbie. Thanks. Okay, great. So, uh, did I do something? Okay. okay. Uh, presenting a checklist we developed at 3IE to guide sensitivity analyses and replications of impact evaluations. And I first want to start out by defining what, in this context, I mean by replication. So, we're in this case, we're actually using the original data from the study, um, and we're using their data as well to kind of check the validity of being able to. Uh, of their claims, as well as the robustness of their findings to additional analyses and checking the recommendations as well. And so the benefit of this type of replication is that it can help increase um, a study's credibility. And so for policymakers, they can use that to help guide kind of what decisions they want to make. And this was one of the motivations of why 3IE um, developed the replication program in 2012, where they funded replication researchers to replicate uh, various impact evaluations across uh, multiple sectors. However, in this process, the way to that replications researchers were using to identify what analyses they wanted to run was kind of ad hoc. It's based off their experiences and their knowledge and kind of what were they reading from the study. Um, but there is kind of like the perception that replication researchers are trying to overturn the original study results um, to generate a controversial finding to be able to, you know, get some more uh, fame for their, uh, their research project. And this process also does actually allow for co-creation with the original researchers. Um, so what we decided to do was kind of give a standardized process or more of a checklist to help guide replication researchers to serve as a starting point when doing this type of replication. So the way we kind of construct this checklist is originally by using adapting um, Annette Brown's and Benjamin Wood's uh, this which test, not which hunts paper, which kind of gave some categories of types of analyses you can conduct in this type of replication. We expanded their checklist or their um, categories uh, by separating it by different uh, identification strategy assumptions, as well as expanded types of analyses can be included. And so we identified additional resources by doing um, looking first at foundational texts within impact evaluation methodologies, focusing on RCTs, and then five quasi experimental designs. And then we did unstructured keyword search in Google to identify additional resources. We also then went through the 22 replication studies that 3IE has conducted over a decade um, to kind of identify what additional analyses or types of tests should be included in this checklist. Um, so just a really brief like highlight of the checklist, there's five primary categories. The first is checking validity of assumptions. So this is for each identification strategy, you know, for example, difference and difference, uh, checking for parallel trends, uh, for general causal inference, checking that uh, the stable unit treatment value assumption is met, as well as there's kind of four, three, four more that are kind of more generic check um, categories, looking at data transformations, potential ways to modify the estimation strategy, assessing heterogeneity, as well as kind of st standard checks. We're thinking about like concordance with the pre-analysis plan, 
treatment of outliers. And so the checklist, each category is structured in a similar way. And I have this example like table. Um, so each one we have identified kind of key attributes, so whether what that assumption that is to be tested, or for you know, in this case, we're talking about instrumental variable, if the relevance condition has been met, a recommended test or check that's coming from the literature. And then there's two columns, a column for comment and a column for action. So this is where the replication researcher can comment, you know, whether or not they thought from reading the original paper, whether or not the assumption has already been tested or met. Um, and then if there's an action they're going to take to test that assumption. And then finally, a resources column. Um, and so this checklist, we want to, uh, we think is value add to the impact evaluation sector, because one, it does compile kind of all of these assumptions and checks into one like one-stop shop resource. Um, and it also complements other additional transparency uh, reproducibility resources like the Acre Guide from BITS. However, I do want to ensure that this is not meant to be a prescriptive checklist. This is just a guide of kind of how to identify potential analyses, uh, especially could be useful for early career researchers who may not have an idea of when to start with the um, replication research. And then also, um, this is also not exhaustive. Like there's across all the disciplines that fall into international development, there are multiple different discrepancies that people do their regression estimates, whether they how they report things. So we weren't trying to put all of that into one checklist and more serve as a general guide of what could be done. Uh, the paper has been published in the Journal of Development Effectiveness and the entire checklist is um, attached as a supplement in a Word, check, Word document to be used. We're really hoping that people will start using the checklist and also add onto this. This is just the first iteration and is nowhere near complete. I also just want to acknowledge my co-authors as well as my team at 3IE who did the project management and got Gates to fund us for this. Um, and that's it. Thank you. All right, let me just jump in with one or two questions, then we'll open it up to um to the floor. I want to just start with one very specific follow-up for uh Patrick. Uh, I found the, the final table contrasting the different fields pretty interesting. And you mentioned that you can kind of like, you can't reject the, the model for economics and social science studies, but you can for psychology. And you kind of left it there, but is that just so I understand, is it is the implication that um, publication bias is the reason for the difference? Or I, I just wanted- I was thinking of Smithy. I mean, I, I'm wondering, if, I was just gonna say, it really feels like this session and the previous talk fit together pretty well, but. You, you were hesitant to maybe go beyond that, but if you were to speculate, could you tell us more about the possible reasons for that, Cap? Yeah, I think there's, um, well, I won't say anything original. I mean, going to the original um, uh, Open Science Collaboration paper, they do make their own speculations that there's very vastly different uh, replication rates across fields, in particular social psychology has it uh, a lot lower. They also tested many more interaction effects, which tend to have lower power and therefore low replication rates. So I think these are two uh, possible reasons uh, that the model doesn't fit as well. Um, of course, another thing is that the null hypothesis is also testing the model itself. And perhaps, you know, there's parametric assumptions in that model. Maybe it, it doesn't fit as well. Uh, so it could be the model itself uh, that's accounting for that. Ron, do you want to yeah, follow yeah, up? Please, yeah. yeah. Um, so I wonder if you can uh, comment on um, uh, Yuri Simon's small telescopes perspective on what qualifies as a successful replication. So uh, in in our defense, I would just uh, uh, mention we, we uh, use that as inspiration in powering the replications that Smithy talked about using two and a half times the original sample size mm -hmm. in the uh, hope of being able to ask the question, does the documented effect size that results from the replication, is would that have been detectable by the original study? Yeah, so I, I think the question of how you should set replication sample sizes is an open one, and I think it's quite a difficult one. And I, I think this is a very nice uh, approach, two and a half. Um, the particular theoretical results and I showed you is for a very specific type of how power set, which is uh, turned out to be the most commonly used, which is can I defect, detect the original effect size with some pre-specified power, 80%, 90%. So uh, there have been more recent replications. Uh, I know John Protzko and co-authors uh, have a paper that's been published uh, last year in Nature Human Behavior, and they have incredibly high replication rates. And the way they pick sample sizes, as I see it, is they just pick really large sample sizes and they screen before to make sure that they were likely to be replicable. So I think there are designs where you do get uh, high levels of replication and the small telescopes, I think, is also could be a useful approach two and a half times. Yeah. 
Thanks. I wanted to ask uh, just also briefly about the uh, the standard the checklist and and that you guys worked on, which seems like a, a big step forward. And just wondered if your team or you personally had thought about um, how to promote adoption of it or what the the avenues would be beyond three IE to to try to get a standardized checklist out there. That's a great question. Um, I think part of it was like one is through here by disseminating to people who are in the movement. Um, I think also I, I am not super in the replication space, but like hearing about I four I R R four R. Yes, um, I think that's really cool because I think that's a place avenue that could be using the checklist as well to help guide maybe for people, especially if they're oh sorry early <laughs> researchers um, looking to do that. So I think. Uh, finding the like stakeholders and people within um, and trying to convince our, now I'm no longer at 3IE to convince 3IE's research transparency team to take this on, to do that work. Great. Um, let's see, uh, let me open it up because I'm sure there's a lot of interest in these, uh, some of these issues. So I don't know if anybody in the audience wants to jump in with questions or comments. Just a question for Don, I guess um, you talk about kind of the painful and, and difficult aspects of this. Are there policy changes that universities should be considering adopting um, basically to protect uh, people who are who are replicating or other kinds of ways that we could mitigate some of the consequences um, for the kinds of people in this room who are, who are doing these replications and potentially finding additional fraud? Uh, I think there are a couple obvious ones that I made a brief allusion to. Uh, one is to um, reward the hard work associated with um, correcting the scientific record. Um, so uh, it, science is self-correcting, uh, as James Heathers has noted, not because of some magical and mysterious autocorrect function. Science is self-correcting when scientists correct it. And uh, that is... Uh, painful and time intensive and costly work. And uh, um, if we are to uh, be proud of our replicable and cumulative science, the field, our universities and our journals need to reward that activity. Um, uh, on the other side is uh, good scientific practice that is less likely to introduce false positives in the literature. We should be rewarding people uh, and research programs that follow high standards, that pre-register, that post and share their data and code that wh whose results are replicable. Scientists were replicating their own results and making it easy for others to replicate their results. Hello, um, I had a question for Patrick. Uh, you had the gr um, graph at the end where you showed, oh, in economics, it seems like it's roughly what we would expect. In other social sciences, it's roughly what we would expect. But in psychology, the replication le rate is less than what we would expect. Um, if you break it down by subfields of economics and psychology and other social sciences, would you expect to see some subfields are better at replication than others? Or, I mean, it's kind of a speculative question, but I just want to hear your thoughts on this. Um, I haven't broken it up by subfield. I, I mean, for the economics and social science, study, there's relatively few uh, observations. Uh, in the economics one, I know there was about 18 observations, so I think you'd have problems uh, if you start to cut it up too much. The psychology study uh, replicated a much larger number, so I think there's some possibility uh, of doing it there, but uh, it depends how many, I guess, what the sample size would be uh, within each uh, subfield. Uh, as I said, if you actually look at just maybe not my predicted uh, replication rates, but the observed replication rates, uh, there is a lot of variation uh, across different fields in psychology. So uh, it would be interesting to see if the model would, could also predict that as well, if there's enough uh, of a sample size. It's a good question. Thanks. What, what do you think is the ideal response like from the field and maybe even from the original authors when some finding fails to replicate even multiple times? Like anything from like the original finding should be flagged in some way, there should be punishment, there should be, I, I don't know, speculate however you guys want. Uh, 
there's a part of me that wants to answer public flogging, but I don't think that would uh, wind up with a net positive result. It's not endorsed by bits. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, there, we've seen a whole spectrum of responses from authors uh, whose work is um, identified for replication. Um, some reacting uh, as if they're they're being personally offended. Uh, others reacting with appreciation and enthusiasm that someone cares enough to pay attention to something that they published, um, and then. Uh, when those results come back uh, in a surprising way, um, we've seen a whole range of responses, everything from original authors uh, defensively denigrating the ethics of the people who undertook the replication. Those people, their reputations don't generally benefit from that reaction. Um, a much more healthy and constructive reaction uh, is uh, shown by those scientists who say that's new information and we should update our beliefs based on that information. Yeah, I'd also add that I think I think things that are not replicated need to be better publicized. I think there's been some research showing that uh, studies that are not replicated still continue to get cited uh, a lot. So it seems like uh, maybe for people in this room that are very interested, uh, we're aware when things don't replicate and we update our beliefs. But it seems like in the broader scientific community, uh, pretty strikingly, uh, there's very little attention. So uh, I think, yeah, there's one big effort in getting more replications done. But then the second effort is is making sure they're actually recognized and seen. Thank you. Um, so uh, I want to be a little bit of sort of like devil's advocate and push sort of in, in the opposite direction because in, in, in the theme that I'm seeing here. So the, the theme that I'm taking away is that psychology is somewhat behind in some like serious issues, like uh, uh, these high profile cases of uh, ethics and replicability. And in economics, we're seeing that we're not that far away from where we should be. But just a, a comment is that there, there's a high fraction of growing research in economics that that where we don't have access to any data, and and like like the the the, the fraction of how or how many genotype cases are happening with administrative data, completely unknown. So and that the, the fraction of that 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 uh, research that's being published keeps growing. So I, I just want to provoke saying that. It, it looks like say psychology it's 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 not showing up so well but that there's a fraction that again no idea and my priors would be that there's there has to be some issues there yeah <laughs> it should be easier to find cases in psychology if it's cheap to conduct replications um expensive uh field studies field experiments that took years and hundreds of thousands of dollars to conduct those just aren't going to be replicated I want to decisively reject that hypothesis. Uh, most of the admin data that you get, hundreds if not thousands of researchers have access to it. And so, I mean, this is a fundamental thing about replications. A replication is a specific targeted one that actually becomes highlighted as this is a replication of something going on, possibly rerunning the experiment, which is different from drawing from the same data. There is a more general way in which there is this whole hidden replication going on because rare is the econ paper that doesn't start with a replication of something and then builds on it and has to publication bias provide something radically new but it starts with that replication they're hidden in the literature they're really hard to tease out but i'm and i'm in the business of sort of checking all these things it's the administrative data in big data centers that I'm the least worried about that somebody will find the replication problems in there because there are literally hundreds of researchers reusing the same data over and over again, which has other problems, right? But it's not that part that's out there. Um, but the replication part comes into play when you want to sort of redo some of these analyses in, in sort of the scaling issue of, of where does it actually take? I might have secret data from a bank I might not even be able to name the bank, but if it is something that we're saying this happens with bank accounts given to people of certain income categories, I should be able to go out and do that. That is by its nature an expensive task, but it's still a valuable task. It just will happen less frequently. 
Um, and I, I think that's one of the, the tensions that goes back to my earlier comment about how expensive is it actually to, to replicate a study. There are by nature things that are just expensive to do. Ask the physical scientists who are running uh, CERN. Um, they only get one stab at it, right? Uh, there is no replication because they're going to tear down the machine and build the next billion dollar big machine. So some of these things are just intrinsic to the way that we need to think about science as well that some are going to be intrinsically expensive. That doesn't necessarily make them less reproducible in principle. And that's, I think, what we should worry about. What other? Yeah, great. I mean, this is this is great. I think it's my own view on that is it'd be good to have solid evidence on it. I mean, both, both points are well taken. Um, Kevin? I'm just jumping in here because there's this low, but I was just, I was trying to think about, um, you know, all of our concerns really revolve around hypothesis testing and most of it is, you know, frequent is uh, null hypothesis significance testing, right? But, you know, as uh, machine learning methods get more popular, where really the method kind of builds in a validation and it's focused on prediction out of sample. Does it does that like fix things? Is it better? Are we better off uh, just switching over to using more kind of data science and machine learning approaches and just giving up on hypothesis testing? I'll give my take, and then I'm curious what the panel thinks about that. But having in, in a couple projects started using more machine learning tools, both to create. Uh, estimate conditional average treatment effects, but also for prediction. Uh, different uh, machine learning approaches under different assumptions with different training data and different features give really different results. So the notion of sort of selecting the model to fit your prior doesn't go away as much as we'd like it. At least that's my take on some of the machine learning methods. But I don't know if people on the panel have a view on this this question. Yeah, you want to go? Oh, I was going to say, uh, with machine learning methods, as you said, the predictive exercise is uh, perhaps answering different questions to a causal question. So I think it depends a lot on the question you're interested in. And so I'd, I'm not sure, maybe machine learning methods could supplement uh, getting uh, a good answer to a causal question, but I'm not sure they could uh, replace it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's also, I think, what the, I think there's so many assumptions built into it when you're building your model that like, there's still, you need to, when you're doing replication of it, you're like, I think there's a lot more testing we still need to be doing on the machine learning model itself to make sure that when we're actually replicating it later, we're meeting those same assumptions as well. So I think there, it's not necessarily a solve all solution yet. So maybe in the future, we'll someday. Any other comments or thoughts? Stefan? Yeah. So it's if I run a bunch of experiments and it just so happens that the true treatment effect is zero for each one, I've got I'm, I only pick interventions that don't do anything. Bad luck. I'm going to get it's it's almost a statistical inevitability that I'm going to get false positives. Right. And if I am testing really risky interventions, this might not necessarily be bad for science to test interventions where a high fraction of them um, are uh, don't really do anything. But if I do that, then I'm going to have a very high fraction of the results that I find be false positives, just as a statistical inevitability. And that means that when people try to replicate my stuff, then it could be that I have a very low replication rate, even if I'm doing really, really good work. So my question then is, how can we, and I would hope that I'm in an environment where um, I'm happy when people replicate my work, even if I know that only a small fraction of these risky studies are actually going to have the results replicated. So then the question for the panel is, how could we create an environment where that's safe, where it's, it's safe to try things, to occasionally get false positives as a statistical inevitability, to have those false positives fail to replicate, but for this to, to be okay and to still incentivize people to uh, to carry out these experiments. Is this making sense?
Um, I, I think that uh, we already have a lot of uh, the system that you're describing, which is to say there are outsized rewards to um, uh, home runs that come from swinging from swinging for the fences. The G whiz amazing, surprising treatment that produces an improbably large effect um, with uh, weak or zero uh, punish punishments for uh, so very little public flogging and um, uh, ver very few costs to researchers who publish false positives. All right, I think we're at time, so maybe we'll thank our panel.